Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Print 27, What Has Changed from Print 26 Edition. Um, my name is Gemma Moorhead, and I'm the Content Marketing Manager at ILX. We'll just give it a couple more minutes for some other people to join. And then I'll hand over to Andy, one of our senior training consultants. Okay, well, I think we will uh, kick off. Um, so before I go ahead, before I go ahead and hand over to Andy, there are a few housekeeping bits I need to cover off. Um, so firstly, everyone, you'll notice you're on mute. Could you please remain on mute throughout the session? But if you have any questions, there is a question box in the panel on the side where you can type them in. Um, if they are technical questions, we'll answer them straight away. Otherwise, we'll answer them at the end of at the session during the Q&A. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email from us tomorrow with the link so you can watch again and forward on to colleagues. Um, we also would like to say give us a follow on social media. We're really active on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. So today's session is going to last about 45 minutes and as I said there'll be a, a time for Q&A at the end. So without further ado it's my pleasure to hand over to you Andy. Thank you very much. I'll turn my camera on so I should appear. Hello, everybody. Um, as the slide says, I'm Andy West. I'm one of the senior training consultants here at ILX Group. Um, I'm a Prince2 and Prince2 Agile trainer. I'm also the lead trainer for the APM qualifications um, and change management. So I cover a few other bits and pieces. Um, in terms of the things I'm going to try and cover today, I'm just trying to move this so I can see where I'm going. Thank you. Um, I have a look at Prince2, a bit of history about what Prince2 and where's it come from. We'll have a look at the purpose of this update. So why has it happened? What are trying to do? To give you a better sense of kind of security, what's the same? And then we'll have a look at what's different um, and the purpose of new elements. We'll have a look at some of those new elements um, and see what they are, how they work, um, where they're included. And then finally, could put the impact on the exams and then how you might take a a course with us should you wish to do so. Why are we doing this webinar in the first place? Well, we actually did a survey um, with a number of different groups regarding do they understand the differences of with Prince 2 from the previous edition, the sixth edition? And around 90% of the people responded went, no. And so it was thought, this is probably a pretty good idea then. Let's go and talk about you know, Prince 2 7. What is it? What's different? What's the same? What does it all mean? So that's kind of why we're here. Um, as a bit of history, for those of you who haven't bumped into all this stuff before, or want a bit just what's going on, Prince 2 was first introduced in 1996. Previously, there was Prince, Projects in Controlled Environments. Uh, basically, it was what's called the components at that point, which we now call the practices, what's called the themes briefly at one point, basically the project management tools. It wasn't particularly scalable. It didn't have that kind of process model to help you go through this. So Prince2 introduced the process model. It's remained Prince2 as the kind of evolutions we go through. Um, so second edition, third edition, uh, even the fourth edition, you see 1998, 2002, 2005, were all kind of updates, adding more knowledge. What do we know about these subjects? How do we make it work? I get a bit more guidance as we go through. 2009 uh, introduced it to seven principles, seven themes, and seven processes. The techniques were taken out and included in the themes rather than being separate subjects in their own right. Um, interestingly, I was trying to look at all of the details between um, the second, third, and fourth. Uh, unfortunately, 
I did actually start looking at Prince 2 in 1998. So I started working on the second edition. Um, I appear to have disposed of the second and third edition uh, copies of the manual. I still have the fourth, fifth and sixth lurking around in my office. Um, clearly, I spent, I don't believe this anymore and threw them away. Um, but it's evolution. And that's the whole point about Prince 2. It's a best practice model. And as we learn more about project management, as we get more mature in project management, it needs to be updated to share what's important and particularly what's going on in the world, what sort of things are important in the project management environment as we go through. So it's trying to reflect those sorts of changes. So what's the purpose of this update? Well, Prince2 is still designed to look after any project of any size in any environment. That's the whole point of the model. When you look at the manual, I'm sure some of you already have, it's quite big, which is, you know, if you've got big projects, you need to do pretty much all of these things. But the important bit has always been tailoring. And the last edition, the sixth edition, very much focused on that tailoring model. It was talked about quite a lot in the early one, in the 2005 uh, version of this. It's how to be tailored, how much of this 2009 version? How much of this do we really need for it to be a Prince2 project? Um, how might we apply this given different circumstances? This version is to strengthen the model, particularly. Um, add some new aspects. So again, um, people certain Axelos, who are the owners of the Prince2 model, actually had a look at doing some market surveys, talking to project management uh, in, uh, practitioners, um, specialist training organizations, all those sorts of people went, what do we need to consider? What needs to go in? And so it was looking at what are some of the new themes in project management? What are the sorts of things we need to be talking about in project management, which the manual doesn't kind of reflect? Um, one of the things that they did suddenly assume at some point that these things were documents. Didn't have to be, but kind of were. You know, you're gonna give people a piece of paper with information on. Um, it's a whiteboard with information drawn on it, so you can't send it to people. And clearly, there are tools that do all these sorts of things, and yes, you can share them electronically. And so they've got to think about how we use data and documentation in a much more livable way. Sorts of things they're particularly looking at. The why we tailor and the how we tailor. Um, reduce some of the rules to that. With the previous edition, one of the things that was included in there was a set of what's called minimum requirements. So the idea is you must use the principles, you must use a minimum amount of all of the themes, the basic practice of project management, um, and the process or techniques or an equivalent as you go through. And those minimum requirements were for every each of those kind of themes like business case, there must be this and there must be that as a minimum. And actually those rules have been reduced so that it is much more about the appropriateness in your own environment. How might I do this? Similarly, all projects require some kind of documentation. All projects require some kind of audit trail of what's going on. So the documentation has been streamlined, it's been reduced. Um, it's starting to look at what are the key things we need to update? Um, where are they? So there's far less of that, you, know, you must have all these bits of paper. And the important one, and this was always missing from Prince2, um, is just bring people to the fore. Now, Prince2 has never really looked at specialist ideas. So is it IT, is it construction, is it engineering? It never has covered those. It hasn't looked at any of the detailed techniques for things like planning or investment and appraisal. And it didn't cover anything about leadership or people management. Those things have been brought in because they're quite important about how we think about what we're doing as project managers. So there is a new section on people in here to kind of get to think about the importance of people in the center of projects. And you'll see that in a future slide as we go forward. So what hasn't changed? It's still got seven principles, the basic building blocks of project management. And the principles are there because they make sense. They prove themselves in operation. So there's, as they are, as they've been for the last uh, two editions of the manual. Themes are now called practices. So it's an update. It's something that we do. It's something that we practice. And we still have the process model, 
that essentially gets us from the start of the project through to the end of the project and shows us the flow, the journey through the project management world as we go through a project. Well, not much. So some headlines, the subtle differences that have changed in these sorts of areas then. Just to kind of, you know, whet your appetite. Couple of title changes. There are seven practices. Business case, it's now organizing instead of organization. We then have quality, plans, risk. It was change, it's now issues. In Prince 2, all potential changes were starting out as issues. So risk is something that may happen, an issue is something that has happened. And a change request is just something that has happened that needs to be dealt with. And then we have progress, how to enter progress through the life of the project. So in general, they're still there. The content has been updated to reflect current practice. Each practice chapter now specifically references techniques, what sort of techniques might be appropriate as some kind of guidance. The management products, the documentation, what documentation is appropriate, what kind of content, how is it going to be used? And importantly, links back to the principles. So from the seven principles, how does it affect this particular practice? How does it affect organization? How does it affect business case? The things we need to make sure that we're linking those elements together and trying to make sure that the whole model is far more integrated. It's not separate things we learn and we apply. It is integrated. So understanding those elements. With the processes, they're still in place. So we have seven processes. Starting up a project, initiating a project, controlling a stage, managing product delivery, managing stage boundaries, closing a project, and at the top, directing a project. We still have those. There still is the flow of information from starting up to directing, down to initiating as we go through. So when we look at the process model, there's still that flow through, you know, escalate up for decisions, come down, do some work, delegate the work, get it back, and so on as we go through. The process maps in the manual have been simplified. And in fact, what they have done is also remove the uh, process diagrams at activity level. So there is just a process map for the entire process. Here are the activities with it. It then discusses those activities. And in the previous manual, if you want to look at who did what in a process, you had to look at the individual activities and try and find out the responsibilities by looking at a tiny little table in each of those sections. There is now a single responsibilities table that looks at all the activities within that particular process. Who does what? Who's accountable for it? Who has to check it's been done? Who's responsible for it? Who's actually going to do it? Who needs to be consulted whilst we're doing it? And who needs to be performed once it's been done? And so the responsibilities tables have been reorganized back to like the racy idea in line with lots of other practices that we use. And again, links from the practices to each process. So for each process, which practices are being undertaken? Which of those basic project management tools are being undertaken in this process and how they're being affected? So again, it's more about that integration to make sure that you review the model as a whole rather than lots of individual little bits. So that, if you like, is the, the subtle changes. Those are the little bits of information that's being changed. So what's being added? Well, a new integrated element. In the past, Prince Tools, as I said, it's made of four elements. The environment, principles, themes, and processes. We now have people in there and practices. And actually, it's putting people at the heart of those things. So we'll look at the kind of uh, the project context, we'll look at practices, we'll look at processes, we'll look at principles, but at the heart of that is people and some elements around those. In the past, there's always been six performance criteria. The things you measure in the life of the project. Time, cost, quality, scope, risk, benefits. But in light of today's world, sustainability. What's important? How are we looking at those? So quickly those. And again, new content on data and digital information um, to sit in the progress chapter, the, the progress uh, practice. Uh, how do we share information? How do we lose? How are we using data as we go through? <clears throat> there are also four example scenarios used all the way through the manual. They're introduced at the start 
and they're essentially there to demonstrate tailoring. How might we tailor this element of Prince 2 to this sort of project? So four quite different scenarios uh, which are used all the way through so you can start to get how would this be used? How might this be applied? So there is guidance on how to use it you know, in practice, but also then an example essentially using these scenarios um, to make some sense of it for you. So let's dive in and have a quick look at some of these things. The theme here is putting people at the heart of project management. So we have the project context, also known as the environment. What's going on outside? Where does this project sit? Does it report into a program, into a portfolio? Does it report directly into the organization, the business? We have our practices, the basic tools of project management. We have our processes. How do we get from one end? The route map through a project. And we have the principles. And these are all going to interact to help us understand how to tailor what sort of things we need to think about as we're managing our project using Prince2. So if you look at that, central to the method, three areas that are particularly talked about in the new people chapter. Leading successful change, leading successful teams, and communication. The communication aspect will very much look at stakeholder engagement. It will emphasize the use of the communication management approach and the networks that we have from our core uh, project interests, business user and supplier, to other people who are impacted, the wider community, both internal to our organization and external. And it talks about mapping those things and understanding the relationships between them. In terms of leading successful teams, it's going to look at some of the things we might consider about how we lead teams, how we get collaboration or cooperation in the team, looking at those kind of elements. But particularly of interest to me, because I work in this particular area, it talks about leading successful change. In the past, it always talked about at the end of the project, in closing a project, we hand over the output to business as usual, to the operational environment, and they will use it to generate the benefits. And of course, that doesn't always happen. You might have delivered to time, to cost and quality, but if you haven't talked to your customers effectively, to your uh, stakeholders effectively, you can hand something over and they go, no, that's not what we wanted. And so the important about this is to start thinking about what do we need to do to get people in a, a position to actually say yes to the change, to buy into it to start using the output and generating the change and this is kind of central to successful project management if we don't hand over the output uh, effectively then actually all of that work goes to nothing and there have been many examples in the past in fact um, in a survey done it, it's a little while ago now i'm sure they're doing a new one um, a survey by price waterhouse coopers found that in poor examples up to 80 percent of projects don't result in effective change because we haven't engaged with our stakeholders effectively we haven't understood what they wanted in the first place particularly or we haven't prepared them for the change and this is what leading successful change is all about so what we're trying to do is where are we now and where do we need to be afterwards and that's about the achievement of benefits that's about the successful adoption of the output from your project and so it talks about having a change management approach which will cover things like who are the stakeholders what do they want what training do they need what support do they need what's a good way to go live when is a good time to do this and conversely when is a bad time to do this it's understanding those sorts of elements and therefore planning for it and this will link into the benefits management approach where it was briefly mentioned in the past that said no, what activities are necessary for the successful adoption of this output. This is now going to look at it as being a much more important element, a way of making sure that hearts and minds are won over, that when we deliver our project and hand over the outputs, we're delivering into fertile ground. People are saying, yes, I want to use it. People who have been trained and are ready to actually use it to go through. And this is a crucial part of projects. So it's been added in. An additional part of the project initiation documentation will be a change management approach, which will start to produce early in the project, and that will trigger some of the activities you might do. It will expand on the things you've got to do in stakeholder engagement and in communication to make sure that they are ready, willing and able at the end. 
so that's if you like an example of the people aspect it works some other things as well a chapter delegated to it and it will then link into all of the practices because they're part of what we need to do in order to make our project work people at the start, heart of the project the other big area that's been added is sustainability and this is something that i suspect that you've probably bumped into or heard about in your own organizations as you go through and it really is about it says achievement of project sustainability performance targets so it becomes another area that we need to manage are we delivering this project and are we using this product in a sustainable way is it appropriate to deliver this um, if i just give you a couple of definitions um, it says all projects have an impact on their environment and project teams need to know about the sustainability targets of the project work and the products required from their project. It's about trying to make sure that we are considering all of the sorts of areas which are crucial in your particular environment, um, whether we're talking about waste, whether we're talking about opportunities, whether we're talking about um, how we and where we procure uh, raw materials from, all of these elements become part of sustainability. And there'll be a sustainability management approach as part of the project initiation documentation. So rather like change management, we need to think about this and embed it in our practices from day one. And it says, define the actions, reviews and controls, establish and ensure that we achieve those sustainability performance targets. In the PRINCE2 manual, they've linked sustainability that we should think about as project managers to the 11 targets set by the UN for sustainability. Um, I was trying to get one of their lovely maps, but all of the diagrams I seem to find, um, when you try to put them onto a slide, become completely unreadable. So I've just reproduced them here for you. Um, no poverty across the world, zero hunger, health, well-being, quality education, gender equality, and so on. Which of these might be impacted by what you're doing? Which of these will have an impact on your project, your deliverables? the ethics within your organization. How might you impact this? So in terms of climate action, are we reducing our carbon footprint? Are we doing less travel? Um, are we using regenerated uh, energy as we go through? Um, life below water in terms of environmental protection and life on land similarly, are we protecting those kind of things? Um, one of the good definitions that found that talks about um, sustainability, talks about building projects and delivering projects in a sustainable way that is appropriate economically now without overburdening future generations. And so it's encouraging us when we're working in projects and when we think about our deliverables, is this sustainable in terms of kind of economics? Is it worthwhile? Do we have the money to pay for it? But actually, does it not steal all of the resources, all of the things that might be needed in the future? Does it improve what we're leaving behind for future generations? And so it's to think about how those things impact your particular project and the importance of those in your area of work. Now, some of you might go, that might be very little to do with us. But actually, if you're I don't know, building a new app for a laptop that takes an awful lot of power to run it, then actually, is there a low power way of doing it? Um, if we're talking about construction, are we talking about you know, brownfield rather than greenfield sites? Are we talking about protecting the environment as we go through? It's all about those kind of elements. Um, reduced inequalities, gender equality, about selection. Who gets to work on our team, who doesn't? Um, it's kind of in the news every day. Um, a lot of these things impact what we do and how we behave as individuals. Um, I was reading the paper today or yesterday evening about um, a soldier who committed suicide under a barrage of intimidation from their boss. Four and a half thousand texts and WhatsApp messages. And you kind of go, is that really uh, uh, dealing with inequalities? Is that about gender equality? Is that about treating people as you'd like to be treated? Which is the sorts of things that we're talking about here. And so it's to look at those in the reality of your own world and which ones do we actually contribute to and becoming part of the things we measure in the project. I'll step down off my soapbox and carry on.
within the progress practice, which is about how we measure progress in a project and forecast uh, where we're going to finish in terms of all those things, it starts to look at using data and digital information. Have we got the right information? Have we got greater accuracy? Are we using analytics to understand where we are? Can we use digital technology to collect data, analyze data, and make sense of where we are? And of course, improve the decision making in our projects. What about applying automation to some of the things we do in terms of data collection or sharing information? Clearly, we've all bumped into the, the, the virtual world, digital systems that support multiple locations. And interestingly, of course, we were prompted to do so by a pandemic. Before the pandemic, things like remote working, virtual courses happened, but not as much as now. And if you look at your own organization, are we going back to doing things all, all face to face? And the answer is probably no. It saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of travel. Um, it's thinking about how we use those tools to work effectively. And it talks about requirements and business maturity. As an organization, what are we ready for? How much of this can we use? Are we using it effectively? Are we willing to try some innovation? Which, of course, is about changing how we work as organizations. Just more projects for us project managers. That's what it's all about. So those are, if you like, the elements that have been added. Those are the things that we want you to, that we want to think about as we apply Prince 2. And it's trying to get Prince 2 ready for the current world, rather than being you know, stuck with bits of paper and stuck with you know, old ways of doing it. Let's think about these new things. And I can guarantee, of course, that this is Prince 2.7. There will be a Prince 2.8 at some point as the world moves on. And we were looking at some of these things again and adding more detail to it. In line with everybody's expectation, I suspect particularly your senior managers, can we simplify the documentation? Can we make sure that we have information which is easy to read and is being used appropriately? And so what the Prince2 manual now starts to suggest is that we've got the kind of project initiation documentation almost as a kind of standard repository of information. There are things you've got to think about that goes in there. There are elements that we might need to consider are crucial as we go through. And, and we've added a couple of things there about sustainability and about change management. But essentially, it's now a single document with those sections in there and guidance about how we might do it. And the project log. Simplify the project log. So rather than having separate bits of paper, do we have, or separate logs, do we have essentially a combined one as we go through? Um, particularly if I look at the project initiation documentation, it says here, it is the basis for, or the sound basis of a commitment. Does it explain clearly what this project is, what its purpose and objectives are, how it's going to be run on a day-to-day -day basis, and do your senior managers, who has the project board, the owners of this project, do they understand their role in making this happen? It becomes the baseline for ongoing assessment. How are we performing against this? How well are we doing? Are we going to finish on time? And so it should be that single source of reference for the project. If you need to know something, it'll be in our project initiation documentation. Now, there is a commercial aspect to this, and that is reflected in the manual that says, well, actually, if you have commercial arrangements, how are you going to do those? So previously, there wasn't a great deal of reference to, if you like, procurement and how you want it. Again, that commercial management aspect has been added in, it's been thought about as appropriate, you'd put it into your project initiation documentation. It's how do I present it? What information do I need? It's making sure you have the right things. Um, guidance for the last two versions of the manual said, you know, what's the best way of presenting this to our, our senior managers? If we put this in front of them, will they read it? Well, they always have assurance to help them review the documentation and make sure that it's fit for purpose. But again, why not put it as a presentation? Why not do it as a series of slides and walk them through it? It still can be version controlled. It still can be a baseline document, but it may be easier if you talk people through it rather than actually have to give them a great big document to read. So those sorts of considerations are included in here. The idea of the project log essentially is, is to capture the continuing change records of all of those things in the project. So issues, lessons, products, quality, risk, other things that are going on. And very much reflects the idea that many organizations had of the CRADE log. It's a single spreadsheet and it has changes. Well, in principle, of course, those would be under issues. And it has risks and it has actions, which is often the, the daily log. 
um, issues, separate one, and then they have dependencies. Um, Princeton has always talked about having a product register, which is your configuration records, your version control records. And it's important we have that so that we can understand what is the current baseline, what is the current approved version of those. And so there is a reference to configuration management, uh, particularly how it supports how we do changes. But an important one in Prince too that often seems to be missed out in many other um, models is the idea of a quality register, which is a register of all of the quality activities. So item number one, what product? How is it going to be tested? Who should test it? Plan date for testing, the actual date for testing, and the result, did it pass or fail? And for those of you who know, that suddenly becomes an audit trail. At the end of the project, it should it will prove that all of the items you've created have been reviewed, have been tested, and have been signed off. I've also known some project managers using Prince 2 include audits on here. So if an audit turns up, they add a note to the quality register. Audit, whole project, what date? Pass. And it shows not just that we've been delivering the right products, but we've followed the right processes, that we're compliant with any rules and standards. And having that audit trail at the end of the project can help enormously in Handover, sign off. Is this project completed? So, those are like the things that have been updated. Those are the elements within Prince 2 that have gone, we need to start thinking about updating these in line with feedback from practitioners, from the people in the project management environment. They have actually included, as I said at the start of this, four scenarios. Four different organizations in quite different environments. So data knowledge, that's it. Um, the mission of leveraging the power of big data through advanced data analytics solutions. How are they doing projects? What sort of things do they deliver? How might they apply Prince 2 as we go through? Um, the Louistown City Council, historical town, with 40,000 residents, over 20,000 visitors per year, and the sorts of things they might be doing as a city council to improve their community. So regeneration projects, uh, development projects, look at all those kind of elements. So we have data, we might have construction, we might have engineering, we might have social engineering, what are we doing? Um, find F about protecting um, it says revolutionize how business identify fraud and protect the reputation of business from those sorts of financial risks. So we're kind of um, a fraud protection agency looking at how they might improve and provide tools to help organizations A, identify and B, protect themselves in the future. And then a not-for-profit organization to reflect the fact that projects happen in all environments. And now BU is help the community to eliminate discrimination, advance international uh, human rights systems throughout local and targeted interventions. And so theirs will be about publicity campaigns, about conferences. The idea of the four scenarios is they're used all the way through the um, manual to give examples of what might happen. I'm just gonna notice my network connection is playing up slightly. I'm just gonna turn my webcam off so I shall vanish from your view. But it's to give an example of how you might tailor prints too, given different scenarios. And the purpose of this is to help you in your own organizations, in your own projects, look at them and go, is there something I can pull from these examples? And perhaps more importantly for you, those of you who have to take this as an exam at some point, they'll be the basis of the practitioner scenarios for the exams. So when you come to the exam, actually, you've already bumped into the subject of your exam scenario, whether it's going to be data knowledge or Louis Town City Council or FindF or even uh, now be you. So there'll be something about this. You can use the knowledge from the manual. You can use the things you've read in the manual to help you with the exam as well. Rather than being a completely new subject, it's something that you'll have bumped into already. So it won't be completely um, off-putting when you start your exam. And that's their purpose in this, to help you understand and also, I guess, help you prepare for those exams as you go through. Oh, so that's, in a nutshell, the sorts of things have changed. That's what's been updated. That's what we've tried to, or as well, 
that people certain access have tried to include in this latest version. Of course, with all prints too, there's always an exam at some point. Um, these have been updated slightly. Foundation, as before, 60 questions, 60 minutes. Uh, it's testing your knowledge and understanding. Do you remember what the Prince 2 manual says? Can you show an understanding of what the Prince 2 manual says? The pass mark is now 60%, so 36 out of 60. I'm not going to do that sum for the next one. Uh, the practitioner, instead of being 68 questions, which is always an odd number, it's now rounded up to 70 questions. It has sections on all of the key areas of Prince 2. So in the foundation, it will be questions that it will dot around, jump around, asking questions about different parts of the scenario. Practitioner, it'll have some questions about the principles, then some questions about people, and then questions about each of the practices. And then the last 20 questions are all about the processes. Two and a half hours, 50 minutes, 60% pass mark as you go through. This is testing your ability to apply PRINCE2 as guided by the manual. So it's to use the manual and the guidance in the manual about application, about how you might use it, and to evaluate it. Has PRINCE2 been used in an appropriate way in this particular scenario? Yes or no, and a reason why. So it's just not just a yes and no. You've got to understand the reasons for saying that. Much the same as they are now, but a slightly updated number of questions and pass mark. So that essentially brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. I clearly must have been talking far faster than I thought I was going to. Just a quick thought. If you do want a course, there's lots of different ways of taking a Prince 2 7 course. Um, classroom, sitting to a trainer, three days and two days. Virtual, similar kind of thing, but much more through this kind of format. Um, online, do it yourself, or a blended one. This is normally an online foundation course and exam followed by a classroom or a virtual practitioner, depending on how you wish to take it, which blends both of our um, highly valued and sought after uh, online course, but also the opportunity to ask questions of a trainer and validate what's going on. All details of these courses can be found on our website, shown at the bottom of the page, ilxgroup.com. That's great. Which Thank you so much. Any questions, folks? Also, <laughs> jump the gun there. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, just also just to let, let everyone know, we also have Prince2.com as well, where you can purchase. So um, it's ILX or Prince2.com. Um, actually, Andy, we've had three questions all around the same sort of theme. Um, okay. I'm happy to answer this, but it's essentially, uh, print, what, if you've got Prince2 Foundation 6 edition, um, yep. Is it best to go to 7th edition? Um, so from our perspective, we've been sort of recommending that people continue on their journey and, and get Prince to 6th practitioner um, yes. because it will still be relevant and it's valid up still up for the three years um, period. Indeed. Yes. If you've got Prince to 6th edition foundation, I think it's until... I'm trying to think of the date. There's usually a six month period where you can take the old one. Um, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gemma. Um, and it may be much easier and convenient at the moment to take your practitioner as a sixth edition one and get yeah. that under your belt rather than chop and change now. Um, as you said, your qualifications for Prince 2 are time limited. You need to maintain them to show that you're doing continuing professional development. Um, mm -hmm. And you can take the exam again or through Axelos, there is a way of doing continual, prof continual professional development, which allows you to maintain it without taking the exam. And there's more details when you pass your practitioner of how to register for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we've, we have a, a very helpful blog actually on Prince2.com. So if anyone would like to look at some FAQs, because as you said, Andy, it's only, it's only valid for three years. So um, to then maintain that, people could then move on to start their Prince2.7 journey. Um, yes. And then, and so that could be a a good option. Um, yeah. So that, yeah. So that's right. Print two is valid for three years. Just to um, answer the question yes. that's just popped into the box. Um, but so far, those are the only questions we've had. So I'm not sure if anyone has any others. Um, we do, I'll give it a couple more minutes. Otherwise, yep. we've uh, we've we've been 
very efficient on that webinar, Andy. <laughs> or I'm just talking way too fast for everybody. <laughs> ah, so someone just asked, when will print to version six stop being delivered? Um, I, uh, from my understanding, I don't believe that's been communicated yet. Um, but what we can I, do is... Okay, I, I, so I, I, I have seen um, an addition. Normally our online packages were for a year. And I do remember seeing recently that there was a six month edition of it. So I suspect that it's probably in about uh, five and a half, six months time that Prince to sixth edition will stop being a valid course or uh, stop being offered as an examination. Brilliant. Uh, what we could do as well is make sure that as soon as we've got the official um, guidance, we'll, we will be sending out communications to our database. So if you haven't already subscribed, um, do please subscribe because then we'll be able to provide an update and um, we'll also be updating our FAQs as and when all more information is available. Um, but thank you, Andy. I, have, I wasn't aware of that. So we'll, we'll be on top of it and make sure everyone knows though. Yep. Um, I think so. Yes, yeah, so far still no questions. Um, but as I said, if you do uh, join or uh, start liking um, our social channels, we're also very happy to answer comments and questions on those as well. Um, we can we have sort of print2.com and also ILX.com, so we manage both of those channels. Oh, and just as I said that, we have another question that's come in. Um, and I'm not sure if this one. So the person who's asked this question, it might be one that I need to take offline with a colleague. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'd have to speak to someone about that one, Ryan, because I think that might be a direct question for us. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, so yeah, I'll leave that one for now, Andy. And Ryan, if that's okay, okay. with you, we'll, we'll take that one offline. I'll make a note. Um, oh, yeah, and so just another just update to let you know, we will be, um, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with the recording. So um, any, if anyone kind of had any experience, any technical issues, we will be sending something out tomorrow and it's available on YouTube. So I'll maybe give it another couple of minutes. Um, otherwise people can have 15 minutes back for the rest of their afternoon. Yes. Oh, I've lost so. my warning. <laughs> well, so I've just had another question come in. Um, so Prince 2 5th edition is still available on PeopleSet website, even after eight, ten years. I think that would be one for PeopleSet. Would you agree, Andy? Yes, I, I would think so, because <laughs> we certainly stopped delivering the 5th the, the edition quite some yeah. time ago. Um, that was 2009, that one. Um, I suspect that there aren't any copies of the manuals left uh, and I doubt any of the yeah. exams are available either. Um, yeah, but yes, that's a good one. We better send that to them. I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll send a quick update to people for that. I think that might just be <laughs> an old page maybe. <laughs> um, uh, there's a question around passing exams. I, I, I personally am not sure about the answer to that one, but I think Andy, course has only really kicked off in the last two weeks or so. Certainly, it, it's a it's a course has only just kicked off in the last two weeks, so they will be available now via people. So you can get uh, Prince Two Seven qualifications if you've taken a course or if you're doing some study now, um, and it's they're all available online, um, and they're proctored online by PeopleSet, who keep an eye on it. Usually, do it. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Andy. Um, mm. Another question has come in. So I think this person may not have print to at all. So they're asking whether if you want to take an exam in January, what, which version would you recommend, six or seven? So I'd say if, if you haven't got print to six. Yeah, if you haven't, go straight for seven. Um, yeah. Because it's the most up-to-date version. Um, it has probably reflects more about the world of project management and some of the tools and techniques being used and some of the questions you're being asked as project managers at the moment. Um, things like sustainability for people at the heart of projects. So that would be an important one to pick up. Brilliant. Yeah, there are some new, as we said, some new elements in print too, which 
you would yeah. sort of need to know from the foundation level to with practitioner. Someone's also asked if the book will help win the exam or just maybe slow, slow you down. So the the foundation exam is always closed book, but the practitioner exam is open book. So actually having a copy of the manual is a requirement for the exam. Um, because you can't remember everything. Nobody remembers everything. Um, even I don't. I've been doing it way too long. Um, and you have to look things up. It's some of the details sometimes of who does what. Um, so I was going through the, uh, one of the exams, a bit of practice earlier on today, having a look at it. And there's still things you go, hang on, I need to have a quick look at the manual for that. Okay. So the practitioner is open book. You definitely need one for that bit. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um... So again, another question around if you have Prince 2 Foundation 6, is it better to do Practitioner 7? And, and we would recommend to continue on the journey of the 6th edition yes. and gain yeah. your Practitioner in the 6th. And then as said, you'll have three years of validity to then be able to take Prince 2 7 after that. Yeah. And it does save you having to buy another manual now. If you've already got the 6th edition manual, it's better to use that and get your Practitioner out of the way. But you'll probably need to do it in the next six months or so. Yeah, that's brilliant. And also lots of thanks for you as well, Andy, has been coming in. So Excellent, thank you very much. <laughs> Should remember not to go on my soapbox and in the middle of some of these webinars, really, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so that's one around if you have a learning disability like dy dyslexia, is there extra time? I believe there is. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, when you register for the exam, you um, should put in a special circumstances request and the exam board would look at that and they can grant you extra time or depending what um, you need, they can actually uh, sort out different arrangements to take the exam or some support while you take the exam. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um, and so sorry, yes, just to clarify, so another question, it, it is advised if you're already on your sixth edition journey and have foundation go to carry on with your sixth practitioner um, and yeah. then you can take print two seven to renew your certification once it's expired in three years time yeah um well there's one around print to agile so um i think ah. i don't know Andy, yep. if you've got but i understand we haven't got much information on that yet <laughs> no um what do they like to know about Prince2 Agile? Does it affect Prince2 Agile? It will do. What you'll find is that Prince2 as the main body will be updated first, and then Prince2 Agile will be updated to reflect the change of guidance in Prince2. So currently, Prince2 Agile talks about seven processes, seven principles, and seven themes. It will be updated shortly, I suspect, to go practices. It will include the people things in there. And people is kind of talked about in Prince2 Agile anyway, so that will be quite important. Uh, and the emphasis on change management will be particularly crucial in Agile in that you have to get people ready in quite a short order to accept an output. So um, I suspect, yes, there will be um, a flurry of activity on Prince2 Agile, and that will be updated in the very near future. So again, anyone who subscribes um, to our email or social channels, as soon as we have information, we will let you know as well. Okay. Um, well, I think that's all the questions. But as I said, if if anything has, anything has been missed, um, do please feel free to message us on social media. Or if you have um, an account manager or a, a, that you work with already, feel free to ask them as well. I think we can leave it there. So thank you very much, Andy. And, um, and thank you everyone for joining as well. And as I said, the recording will be available um, from tomorrow. Thank you, folks. Thank you. So have a good rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>